What was this thing that was inside of you that was forcing you not to fail? Like, we all have the, like, when yeah. I worked for my brother-in-law's roofing company, yeah. when I took that job, the night before I drove to my brother-in-law's roofing company, uh -huh. I had a really thin car. Like, I didn't sleep all night. And I said, okay, here, my mother told me once that when I was a kid, my mother got mad at me once. And she goes, when you get older, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do. If you, if you clean toilets, clean toilets. It's yeah. a job. If you sweep, sweep. But make sure you're the best at what you do or that you try hard to be the best at what you do, you know? When I got the job with my brother-in-law's roofing company when I was a kid, you know, I knew one thing, that for me to work for him, I had to be the best worker on that job site because I never wanted somebody to go to him and go, hey, your fucking brother-in-law is a fucking dud. Right, right, right. Exactly. I never wanted that. Yeah. So I knew that I had to be there at 7. Even though the job started at 7.30, mm -hmm. I would be there at 7. And if the job ended at 4.30, I'd be there at 5.15. Right. I, you know, I did things they didn't even ask me to do. Right. Is this the same way you felt about comedy? A hundred percent. Even more so. But just coming here, just knowing that, you know, fleeing a war in Kuwait, seeing my mom and dad lose everything, losing my father, just like all these things that I couldn't control, right, happened. And it felt very much now like you destiny. lost your father when you moved here, correct? I lost my father, like, yeah, about four years after we moved here. He didn't come until he couldn't get it. Because, you know, like, the dad's got to do everything. I'm going to finish up the paperwork. And you were living in a war, I was, if you don't mind me yeah, with the So it was, uh, I was born in Kuwait, left Kuwait after the first Gulf War in 1990, about three months into it. And then my mom got my sister. How old were you when the war was? Nine. was and do you nine. remember shells? I remember everything about it, every like details about it. I mean everything. But when the when the Iraqi soldiers came in, and it was just a quick takeover, and it was a big robbery more than anything. Like you didn't hear much, like uh, as far as like the shooting and the what have you. I didn't. I wasn't like fully part of that. I was part of the chaos. So Saddam Hussein like dropped off all these um, guys that were in prison and told them to just rob Kuwait. It was a big robbery. It was a massive, massive robbery more than anything else. His dispute was that Kuwait's been stealing from us for years. You know what? I'm taking over Kuwait. Kuwait's actually Iraq anyway. Fuck you. This is mine. It was all political play, but forget it. I was now, 90 years old. When you say though. rob them, yeah. were they coming into your house and smacking you? And they, were, they were trying to. So they came into the house uh, the first time, the, the day of the invasion. They took over the whole neighborhood because the neighborhood was owned by the Kuwaiti oil company, who my father was employed by. So that was a really strategic point for that military. So they were there, and then they took over the whole situation. Once they found out we were Palestinian, they backed off. My mom told me they were going to throw a grenade into my room. They were going to, like... They were going to do something, and then she stopped. They stopped them. They talked them out of it, and the, like my dad was just all about feed these guys, feed them. They're hungry. They just came off a war from Iran. They're starving. They're here to steal because they're hungry. So we fed them. My, my mom and dad would feed them. They would come over to the house in the morning. They would take all the food. They would eat, and they would just leave. They would leave us alone. My father was always worried about his daughter, of course. God forbid she gets raped or something happens. And the shit that goes down during war, he was just being very protective for that. And he paid the ultimate price for it, man. He was like, the stuff I found out years later. He was like uh, kidnapped. My mom had to like pay a ransom to get him out. It was a really intense time for my family. Now, I felt it. They didn't tell me everything, but I felt it. And I ended up in Houston when I was nine. Then my brother took me to change, you know, just kind of change the vibe a little bit. So he took me to watch uh, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. You know, every year they have that joint with all these big headliners. And that year was co-headlined by the band Alabama that I went to and Bill Cosby. And I saw Bill Cosby on stage. I was 10 in front of 67,000 people at the Astrodome. And he's just murdering. And I was like, what is this art form that allows you to sit in a chair and speak in this little tiny microphone, this lapel mic, and just kill a whole crowd? With nothing? Just control them with your voice and storytelling. I'm, I'm going to do this. I looked at my brother. I was like, I'm going to be a comedian. He was like, yeah, yeah. You know, he was like, oh, I'm glad you're having a good time. I was like, no, motherfucker, do you not understand? I just found my destiny, bitch. And that's where it came down to. It's like, that's why I figured out I was going to be a comedian. And then two years later, my dad came, and then he passed away shortly after that. It was, uh, it was a really, really crazy time for me, man.
It's really, really crazy. That's how I said I didn't even know who Bill Hicks was, who Sam Kennison was. Uh, I didn't know the rich history that Houston had in stand up. I remember I was doing open mics, like, ah, this guy is, hey, he sounds like Sam Kennison. I'm like, who the fuck is Sam Kennison? 